welcome you uh, at the panel, uh, how to get funded from top tier VCs. So here uh, on the stage, I can introduce you the representatives of a top tier VCs. We could, um, we could invite here. So we've got Mira Mihailova from Piton Capital. We've got Carlo Biggio, investor from uh, Axel. We've got Paweł Hujinski, partner in Point9 Capital. As well as Martin van Heisweg uh, from Prime Ventures. Uh, I was practicing the pronunciation of this uh, all the morning. So, uh, you know, let's, let's start from just short introduction and just please tell us, tell the, the, the audience, uh, what fund do you represent, how big is it, what is the capitalization and uh, what are you looking for here? Um, let's make a, yeah. Sure. Um, so, Piton Capital, uh, for those of you who were here for my session earlier today, uh, that's a climbing tool and uh, not a snake. Other than that, uh, we're London-based, geography agnostic. Most of the portfolio is from Europe, but we have things uh, outside of Europe as well, as far as Australia and Pakistan and Colombia. Um, other than that, stage agnostic. The first check is 200,000 to 20 million. That's the range, uh, euros. <laughs> so pretty much anything under the sun. And um, industry agnostic. So the only real focus we have is network effects. So quite often marketplaces, platforms, uh, social networks, data aggregation companies, AI and machine learning. And um, in terms of capitalization or AUM, we have several funds and, and a co-investment vehicle, uh, actually a, a few. Um, and I think that in total, we've deployed about 200 million euros across all the funds and vehicles that we have. So that's a, a bit of a, com a complex one there. Martin. Uh, thank you, Martin, for pronouncing my name so well. Um, so I'm Martijn, uh, I'm with Prime Ventures, a uh, growth stage fund out of Amsterdam, but investing uh, all across Europe. Um, we are investing from a fifth fund at the moment, which just closed at 250 million euros. Um, and we're looking at growth stage companies across Europe. Uh, average ticket size would be between 10 and 30 million euros. Um, and in terms of sectors, we look at everything. So marketplace, obviously. Uh, also fintech, travel, prop tech, you name it. Um, yeah, that's a prime in a nutshell, I would say. Hi guys, my name is Carlo. I work for Axel in London. Uh, Axel is a venture firm that was started 35 years ago in the Valley, and that's also where the Calver culture was born. Uh, 20 years ago, we opened our London office, with which we cover uh, Europe, Israel, and Russia. And uh, 10 years ago, we started our Indian office in Bangalore. So we have three uh, local strategy. And on top of this, we also have a global vehicle which does growth investing, so later stage investing. As a whole, the firm manages uh, north of $10 billion. Uh, and out of London, we are currently managing our fund number six. That is around $575 million in stage. Um, we are industry agnostic. We do anything that is tech, uh, consumer finance, consumer internet, security, enterprise software. Um, the only thing we don't really do is biotech or hardware. So we're pretty much well spread out in terms of investment thesis. Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Pavel. I'm a partner with Point9 Capital. We're a Berlin-based early stage fund. Uh, we focus exclusively on seed and small series A investments <clears throat> in companies with network effects or doing software. So this is like our buy uh, kind of two, two focus areas that we have. Uh, we do it all around Europe uh, and the software in the software space, we also do it in North America uh, and occasionally in other places like Australia, like you guys. Uh, and uh, we've been doing it for around 10 years. We backed over 100 companies. Uh, we invest between a few hundred K to the first few million uh, that the startup raises. Uh, current fund 76 million is the fund number four. 
Um, yeah, I think these are the key facts. Okay, thank you. So I assume all of you guys are uh, within the investment period and you can invest in these uh, nice entrepreneurs here, yeah? Okay. Definitely. Um, so uh, since the you know the subject of this um, of this panel is uh, how to get funded from top tier VCs, so let's uh, try to you know define what does it mean the top tier VC in your opinion? Uh, is it like uh, you know the financial performance or is it something something else? What, how how do you how do you differentiate the top tier or good VC from the bad one? I know that here we've got only the good VCs, but, you know. It's, it's hard to say, but at least for, for Excel, uh, one of the things that, you know, we have as a competitive advantage is the fact that, you know, we've been founded 35 years ago, and uh, the, over 35 years we built a really global network of partners. This can be enterprises or advisors, et cetera. So, you know, what we try to, when I think about top tier VC, I think how much value you can actually add to the company you invest in. And every time we invest in a company, they have an automatic, you know, pass to all the networks that we've built over these years. And similar to marketplaces, right, you know, when you create a network effect, you know, the bigger is the network, you know, the more value you can extract out of it. So that's a bit uh, my view on the, on the, on the value add. Okay. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, it's one, one possible answer. It's like the size and the scale. And if you've been doing it for 30 years and you survived, it means you, you must be doing something right. Uh, I think th there could be other answers too, right? So like people maybe with smaller portfolios, but with a focused strategy uh, and proof that they can uh, invest repeatedly in great entrepreneurs, great companies that keep recommending them. Uh, it's another way of being a good VC, I think. Uh, uh, and, and probably there is other answers as well. Uh, so this top tier VC, I think everyone uses the term, but it really doesn't, it, it's hard to define what it means. For LPs, it means returns. Huh? Do, 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 do they make money on a regular basis? Okay. I would think, yeah. So how about the success stories? Just reveal just you know one or two of your recent success stories of the startups you've got in your portfolio. Uh, yeah, so speaking for Prime, uh, we invested quite some time ago in takeaway.com, uh, which is a food delivery platform. Uh, at the moment we invest, they were only active in Netherlands and Belgium, um, but we clearly saw that uh, customers were really predictable and profitable. Uh, so we started to double down on marketing, uh, grew our market dominance, and at that point uh, we started to do some acquisitions in uh, Germany as well, uh, a company called Lieferando or in Poland called as Pischnepel, if I pronounce it. Uh, Pischne, I will translate Pischne. 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 Uh, and that company finally uh, IPO'd a couple of years later, so that's uh, definitely one of our uh, successes so far. Okay. Um, in our case, uh, we have a second-hand car marketplace B2B uh, out of Germany, which is uh, one of Europeans' unicorns, three billion now. And uh, we've been with them since Series A. We led the Series B round. Uh, one of the Piton partners is a chairman. Auto One, you mean? Yeah? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I was just uh, uh, quizzing you. <laughs> so we shared this uh, food story with you guys. We've been in Lieferheld, uh, uh, which is now merged with Lieferando. So that's, that's a pretty cool story. Everyone who got involved in food delivery early on has a success story to, <laughs> to share right now, I guess. Uh, yeah, but uh, I think um, in terms of success stories, uh, the great thing is when you get really involved early on and then you see how these companies evolve and whether your thesis worked out. Sometimes your thesis doesn't work, but it's still a success story. Sometimes your thesis works, but it doesn't work. <laughs> so it's, uh, I think as a VC, you, you make, most of your decisions are wrong to invest. Uh, so it's a little bit of a paranoia. So the success stories are super nice, but they're like a small part of a, of a job that where you're wrong all the time, pretty much. Uh, I don't know if you guys agree. So, yeah. <laughs> so even those top tier investors, they make more investments where they lose money rather than when they make money. Hopefully the ones that work are really big. So they pay for the others. Okay, how, how about you, Carlo? I mean, the recent success stories, maybe you've been involved? 
Um, so I think you know the, the most relevant is uh, UiPath, which is a robotic process automation business out of Romania. Um, so when we invested in Romania, everybody was like, oh, Romania, what is Romania? What does Romania do? Um, and now, uh, $7 billion later, like, you know, the, the company is pretty well known. It's one of the fastest growing company uh, in the software space we ever backed, and they're really excited about them. So that should be. And to your credit, like, I think everyone in every VC in Europe has seen that deal, and almost no one wanted to do it. That is so right, that's yes. like when you do this kind of stuff and then it works, that's, I think, like triple rewarding. But as you right? said, you know, you, yeah. you, we, make more, we make more wrong decisions than right. So, and obviously, the one that goes well is going to hopefully repay for all the work. Okay, excellent. Uh, so, so if you are saying that also for the investors, uh, the returns are important. So, can you reveal some numbers on the last funds? I mean, I IRRs, the rule, cash on cash. I think the rule of thumb in this industry: if you do more than three x on the fund, doesn't matter if five years, ten years, whatever, then then you're good. You're in business. You get money to do more. If you okay. can't do it on a re recurring basis, then your job is at risk. You, you know that you set a high bar for us, yeah? For market one capital, yeah? <laughs> and 3x doesn't sound like a lot in, in this high growth business, but given that most of the stuff doesn't work. Absolutely. Yeah. Do okay. you guys agree? I think 3x is the yeah. rule of thumb, yeah? yeah. So, uh, if we are talking about top tier VC, it's not only about financial, only about financials, but it's also about, you know, just developing the people, entrepreneurs you work with. So uh, do you somehow, you know, the measure their sat sat satisfaction, you know, how they are satisfied uh, with working with, with your funds? Or you measure it by number of, I don't know, warm leads coming from the network or? Yeah, I mean, there is soft ways, right? Like, do they pick up the phone? <laughs> like, okay. If they don't, maybe they're not happy. Uh, uh, do they, like, recommend their friends when they raise... Uh, or, like, actually, entrepreneurs are the most important source of deals for us. So it means some of the people we worked with in the past kind of must have liked it. Uh, if this wasn't happening, then it wouldn't be the case, I guess. And then we once did an NPS survey. Everyone was super happy. Probably they thought, okay, maybe I will need money from them again. <laughs> so let's better put in 10. <laughs> so, okay. But uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's very soft. It's people's business, I guess, right? No, I agree. I think it's, uh, for us it's really important that they call us. So it doesn't matter if things are really bad or really good. Uh, we know that they, you know, we're a good relationship when the first thing happens and you just call the, your investor to tell what's going on. Uh, so I think that's very important. And as you said, also for us, although we're later stage with respect to point nine, you know, referrals from entrepreneurs. So if somebody refers a fellow entrepreneur that it goes through the same struggle to us for an investment, most likely it means that that entrepreneur actually likes to work with us. So that's really important. Okay, so how many how many projects do you scan re per year? I mean, how many you know startups you you assess? Yeah, I would Roughly. say into the thousands, <laughs> and that's uh, yeah. So for some of the companies, it just uh, you see in five minutes, it's nothing for us. Like we are not gonna invest in a company that uh, buys and sell oil, for example, but. Uh, yeah, for I think hundreds of companies, we do a deeper analysis, like spend at least a couple of hours on it, and then you have the funnel, obviously. Yeah, same for us. Hundreds a month. Okay, so from what sources sources do you do you get these companies? You were saying that you know entrepreneurs or the you know the network is really important. Just, is it true that you know the best way to, to approach your fund is through the network of entrepreneurs? Well, definitely the case with us, um, entrepreneurs, angels, who might have been successful entrepreneurs with us before. Um, quite often, early stage funds that we work with, and we have a kind of an overlap in terms of investment focus uh, because we are kind of series a and above funds so uh, very often the seed stage funds are happy to share um, you know those that are too late for them or some of their portfolio and these are some great companies they're already triaged and approved by a good uh, good vc out there 
Yeah, for us it's also, um, we do proactive scanning as well, obviously. So we uh, do sector deep dives, or even when we're uh, on due diligence on a certain company, uh, they always working with uh, other startups as well. And then sometimes we even find uh, companies in a totally different sector which are interesting for us. Okay, so do you somehow, I know, employ the, 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 the people who hunt for, for the projects in different countries, like, uh, you know, the, the, the project hunters? Not in That's our hard, case. Hard job, huh? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, we, do. We, we, have a, we usually have a, a similar to prime mathematic approach. So we do practically reach out to companies, and then we try to have uh, each of us covering a certain, you know, area specifically. This do, you know, obviously to the, the strategy we have, which is cover Israel, you know, Europe and Russia. And obviously, you know, having a lot of capital deploy, you need to also have a certain structure, you know, to, to follow the conferences, for example, or, you mm -hmm. know, to follow the list of interesting startup coming to all of those regions. So we need to be a bit more structured. Okay, so let, let's assume I'm entrepreneur and I'm sitting here at the audience. What, what's the, you know, the best way just to approach you? I mean, how... It's how like super easy these days, right? There's Twitter, LinkedIn, email, everything's public. I, I, I wouldn't care so much about the channel. Uh, actually, one learning for me over the last 10 years or so is to try to, as much as possible, ignore social signals. So I don't, I try not to look who, who intros me or, or doesn't intro me. Like, for example, the UI path story, it's, uh, we didn't spend any time on it because it came from a later stage investor and the company had some trouble and, and they sent it to us. And I was like, okay, these late stage guys send a deal to us. I'm sure they spend a lot of time on it. I'm sure it's not good, they just forward it. And it was a negative social signal that I put maybe too much weight on, right? Uh, and, and the same the other way around, if someone is a positive signal, then yes, maybe I will just prioritize it quickly for just for the quick first look, but I really try to like shut it off uh, because it's really about the insight that the entrepreneurs have in, in developing what they have. I think that's the most important thing. So, so yes, there is this old school saying like warm intros and stuff. Uh, I wouldn't care so much about it in the age of everything being open and you just drop people's emails and if you phrase it in an interesting way and are to the point and it's clear what you do, then, then people will get back. If you send a business plan with 100 pages and hard to understand text, then obviously no one will get back. Uh, um, so I think good communication is more important than the channel, actually. Is, is it the same in Axel? How, how about the warm introductions? Is it? You know. uh, no, we, we do care quite a lot about warm introductions, especially when coming from uh, seed funds that we work with before or from angels. So we're definitely going to have a look at those companies. But as I said, uh, similar to Prime, we do a, a lot of outbound. So it's us you know, scanning uh, the market for all the companies in enterprise automation and calling cold call, call those companies. So those companies don't come to us. Uh, it's, I would say, probably 70% of my job. Whereas the rest is, you know, companies that I might meet at a conference. So, for example, I came here to Warsaw and many investors keep talking about one company. So it's 100% chance that I'm going to talk to that company. Uh, you know, it's, uh, okay. uh, it's, it, it's as easy. Um, and then, uh, yeah, but I agree with Pavel. Sometimes we are biased because, you know, if, if Pavel sent me a company, you know, I know it works for a great fund, I'm definitely going to check it out. Maybe it just sent me the company because, you know, he's very excited about it. There's nothing exciting. Maybe if a random fund sends me a company, I think, well, you know, I never work with that guy. How can I trust? I don't even take a call. And sometimes you miss, you know, good deals like that. Okay. Some more comments, how to approach you? Traditional ways? Sending a, an email only? No, I think it, we definitely over-index on warm introductions, unfortunately. And we do a very little active sourcing, um, which is uh, probably not great. But uh, I think if, if you are sending an email, it's, it's really important to be on the point. And, you know, a few, few key points on your traction or what you're doing. Make sure you've done your homework. So, you know, Piton is about network effects. Start with, you know, here are the network effects in my business. This will impress me so much, as opposed to, I think someone mentioned, the, you know, 10 pages of attachment, um, which makes it really hard for me to get to the important points. Uh, so, that, so that's one. Um, and I guess, yeah, uh, that still works. Okay. 
Yeah, I think it's the same for Prime actually. Just uh, you should know what we are looking for and then uh, yeah, make the message accordingly. Okay. So uh, how about do you set somehow, you know, in this investment thesis like uh, I'm scanning this segment and do you do the active hunting maybe? Just, you know, just calling the companies you would like to meet? guys do it all the time, I guess. Yeah. So, so how, how, does, how does it work? I mean, when these guys can, e <laughs> yeah, but when, when these guys can expect, you know, that, that you will call them? Um, so, for example, I would read a report by McAfee saying that, you know, IoT security is trending. It's an interesting report that I would do a was scan for all the IoT security companies in Europe. And as Pavel said, you know, it's not a call center, but you know, we do call call companies, and sometimes companies don't want to pick up the phone because they're not interested. Um, it, it happens also that, but you know, we try to, so we try to come up with a thesis, look for the companies, and then you know, select three or four companies that you know fit the thesis, and then obviously do some work and understand whether we can actually place a bet. Ninety percent of the time. Uh, ended up not being interesting. It's the nature of the game, right? So we, we have to talk to a lot of businesses that we invest in very few. But at least, you know, after you diligence a space very well, it's very helpful to have that kind of diligence then to use to diligence new deals. So it's, it's never a work that is being wasted. Okay. Yeah, for us it's also, if we're invest, uh, investigating company, we also uh, check the competitive landscape, of course. And if we, with one company, cannot come to a deal, but we see that there's uh, certain good competitors in the market as well, then yeah, why not we, we approach them uh, proactively as well. So, so w what milestones, what, what KPIs should be presented by the company uh, that, you know, w when you think that this company would be for you, would be interesting for you? I think ours will be a weird one uh, because we're after network effects, uh, the things we get excited about are uh, different. So as I mentioned earlier today, if you have your small niche where you are dominant, you can show me some kind of real traction from the overall market, that will be highly impressive for us. And um, if, you, if you show this understand, understanding of, I'm only using this as a stepping stone into the bigger market, that will also be a very, very impressive. So it's not, not so much the KPIs, it's more qual qualitative um, stuff, but um, I think that def definitely ticks our boxes. Um, other than that, I, I touched on, of course, the wallet share uh, for B2B and usage and engagement for B2C uh, type of businesses, because it, it tells you that s you know someone is finding a lot of value in your product. And again, that can be very qualitative or quantitative. How about you guys? No, I think we we very much value like unique insights. So like I don't know, you worked in the steel processing industry, you spotted a problem, and then you start a startup that addresses this. So like an insight that many people will not have because they haven't been close to the problem. And then uh, some early happy users, and in B two B or software, this will be a handful of maybe first I don't know pilots or paying customers or something like this. And in B two C, it will be like you know, interesting metrics of engagement and stuff. Small level, but it needs to be like indicative in, in a strong way. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, I think, that's our sweet spot type of deal. Sometimes we go later, sometimes we do earlier, but most of the stuff we do is some early traction and some deep, interesting insights that are fairly unique. For us, it's quite similar to actually what Pavel said. So um, obviously, we have some benchmarks that we have accumulated by investing in, in a lot of companies. But it's, we never stop at the, the KPI, otherwise you're gonna get rid of like 95% of the deals and probably it's the wrong decision. So we look a lot of uh, customer calls when it's a B2B. So if uh, you know, a customer call, a uh, customer really excited and thinks that there's gonna be a long-term investment for them, that's a great sign. If you're looking at a consumer app or you know, um, anything that is consumer-based, engagement metrics, and this could be you know, very good early and then you know, they continue to be very good after a year, that probably there's something there. Um, that's very important for us. And obviously, the team is also at our stage the number one thing. So as Pavel said, so if I'm investing in, a, in an oil uh, service business, I mean, we don't really do oil service, not a great example, but if I'm investing in customer success and uh, the founder is been working on customer success for the last 25 years, then probably, you know, we should have a chat with him regardless. Okay, okay. And do you? 
Yeah, so since we are investing a bit more in uh, later stage deals, we also look, uh, for example, for B2B marketplaces more at uh, uh, development of cohorts. So if we see customers growing over time, that obviously means that uh, customers are happy with the product. Um, and as uh, Mira said, for B2B managed marketplaces, so uh, where the platform actually adds value to the to the whole uh, yeah, to the whole transaction, we look at take rate as well. So actually, how much is the is the value? Uh, how much is the service valued by the customers? Okay. So the the last question, and then we'll have the question from the audience. Uh, what kind of support can founders, you know, expect from from your funds? I mean, what usually you provide them? No support. No support. So, <laughs> so we typically invest in 10 to 12 companies out of our fund. So that means that uh, all companies in our portfolio actually get uh, both uh, the capital they require, but also uh, the full support of our team, meaning that um, yeah, we're always available for the team and it differs from some other funds which uh, invest in 60 to 70 uh, companies per fund uh, and maybe they're not available all the time for the portfolio companies. Uh, the way we think about it, there's like a number of layers. I think one is like just behave, be, be a good citizen kind of thing. So if there's a tough situation, don't abuse it, you know, be helpful, be there even if you know, you're sure you lose the money. Like everyone's helpful to the successful founders. The question is, what do you do in difficult situations? And, and I think that that's where you build some of the good relationships and reputation yeah. for for the longer term. Uh, I think other things is we we were fairly focused thematically software marketplaces. So we think the companies we back it's a community of I don't know, two three hundred founders. Uh, that share, that have things in common, and we try to bring them together so they can share some best practices. Uh, also, our as investors, our the, the the things we spend time on tend to be like somewhat similar. So maybe startups can benefit from this expertise from the network we built over the years because it's relevant. So I think in the, it's just just not one single thing. Uh, I've heard very good opinions about your point nine, you know, meetings and retre retreats. Uh, I still wait to, to be invited, yeah, you know, okay. once. Okay. Can I join <laughs> as well, please? <laughs> How about you, Carlo? Uh, Mira, you want to go first? Oh. Okay. Um, so f we have uh, different categories where we help entrepreneurs. I mean, as I said, we like to be the first call all the times so when things go bad and things go well. Um, we help a lot with hiring, especially when there's a geographical expansion involved, more specifically in the U.S. So hiring, you know, C-level, but also hiring, you know, head of operations and all those, uh, you know, all those personas that can help scaling the business. Another thing we do quite well is to help with the strategy of the business. Obviously, we invest in founders that know, you know, what they want. We just want to be a support of them, but we can be helpful, for example, introducing them to customers if they're enterprise sales, or introducing to a partners if they have a B2C company. And another thing we do, and UiPath is an example, is to help creating a category. Now everybody knows about RPA, uh, but obviously, you know, it took a lot of time, you know, and a lot of seminars, a lot of workshop that you do all around the world to create a category. And that's also one of the things where we get more involved. Excellent. So, yeah, I mean, we, we do a lot of introductions as well, either investors or customers. We're always happy to help with advice. Uh, but we also have done some uh, kind of extra things, the extra mile. Um, there's an example of um, a personal loan of 20,000 that we gave to one of our founders to fix his roof, for example. Uh, another example, when I was uh, head of partnerships for one of our portfolio companies for a year and a half, I closed one of their biggest deals at the time. So I'm still head of partnerships on their cap tech, on their kind of organizational chart. And I'm always invited to the team uh, events, which are amazing. Um, but yeah, we, we do go the extra mile. And if you want us to be with you and be operational, we can do data analysis for you. We can do your deck. Um, anything really flies with us. So just ask for it. Excellent. So uh, thank you for, for you know, participating here in, the, in this panel. Uh, thank you, Carlo, Mira, Pavel, Martin. Uh, right now, the questions from the audience.
so what are the podcasts, articles, authors that you would recommend to us or possibly to, to a marketplace uh, startup founder? I hate to be a self-promoter, uh, <laughs> but uh, one of the best articles that I ever wrote on Marketplace is written by my colleague, Andre Brasoveanu. It's the 10 KPI that matters. It's on Medium. I really recommend you, know, you have a look. It's really, really helpful. And then I also uh, follow the 0.9 posts on Marketplace, I have to admit. They're really good. So you should definitely check them out. Great recommendation. <laughs> Sylvia from Warsaw University of Technology. I know that we learn from uh, mistakes generally. So you have a lot of uh, track records of, as you said, also of failure of invest in investments. So not only sharing success story is just the key for learning. So would you uh, finish? This is the ask uh, request to each of you, the sentence. I will never invest in a startup which lacks and three dots. Would you finish this? Lacks? Oh. I think my learning, I, it will not be an answer to your question, but <laughs> I, in, a, in, in my, in, I think it is business, there is very few, if any, rules that always apply. So I think if I finish that sentence two years later, I would maybe break this rule. So I, I, I don't think I have any rule that is like 100% always true. Yeah. yeah, I think the only thing that we definitely shouldn't invest is uh, if we don't really trust the entrepreneur from uh, moment one. Uh, it's always very easy if uh, things are, is, are going well, uh, but when business is going a bit worse, then uh, you see how people really are, and if you don't trust them from uh, moment one, then uh, you shouldn't do it in the first place. Hi, uh, this is Piotr from Market One. Uh, I'd like to flip the question from, from the topic of, of this panel. Let's suppose uh, a startup has all the KPIs in the right place and uh, is growing nicely and, and you like it, but what's the quickest way to not get funded despite having good, good traction? And, and being a nice project. I think what Martin just said, I think that actually is frequently the case if everything looks good, but sometimes you just think that maybe the numbers are not quite, you know, real. <laughs> or, <laughs> uh, or uh, I don't know, in the past they had another business relationship and the reputation of the founders is that, you know, they don't treat their partners well. This kind of stuff, I think, doesn't have to, but is very likely to, you know, uh, kill any deal, probably. Yeah. Because it's a partnership for frequently 10 years or more, uh, and there will be moments where, where, where the relationship can be abused in both ways, and if you're sure you're working with a person that will do that at the first occasion, wh why start, right? Hey guys, Donatas from Unboxed. Um, if you were a founder, and if you knew everything about your capital venture capital fund that you know now, when would you not take money from it? Can you rephrase? Yeah, or, or did you get it? Because I didn't get it. Yeah. Buy us some time, please. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you bought some time. Okay, so. If you were a startup, an entrepreneur, right? And you knew everything about your VC that you know now, when would you not take money from it, if, from a startup's position? If, if you're a gaming company, don't come to us. We have zero idea about gaming. Uh, waste of time, yeah? for example. Is that, that, is that the question, kind of? No, but yeah? <laughs> uh, so I think you, you mean, um, when you don't want to take the money because you feel like the VC is not the right one for some reasons. I think, yeah, maybe not hopefully with us, but uh, sometimes you will find that maybe the other side is trying to take advantage of you, either take too much of your business at this point. I think uh, the previous VC panel touched on that, like you don't want at your seat to be left with a tiny amount of your company, uh, not just for incentives reasons, but also it will 
make funding for you much harder going forward. But sometimes VCs, uh, you know, they, they just look after their own interests. So you have to make sure that on the other side, it's a VC that will look after your interests as well. So it will be a, a, a fair, you know, a fair relationship, both, both sides. Hi, Eric from Jet Seafood. Uh, do you feel that the startups and the entrepreneurs are good enough at doing reverse DDs? So basically checking out the VCs before they let them invest to see if they actually walk the walk? Yeah, I think they're getting far better. So especially for us, um, at a certain stage of due diligence, we receive a lot of requests from obviously entrepreneurs to meet other founders. And you know, we meet, they want to meet founders where the stories didn't really work and founders that have been successful. So I think it's definitely, they're much more aware of the kind of DD they have to perform before getting into the marriage with the, with the VC. Yeah, I would definitely say it's getting better since the uh, European VC landscape is developing as well. Uh, but we also encourage uh, entrepreneurs uh, who we are talking to to uh, talk to some of our portfolio companies to see if there's actually a, a fit possible. Because it has to work both ways, obviously. Hello, my name is Eileen Leijten from the Netherlands. Um, I'm a founder and when you talk about funding opportunities in the Netherlands, 1.6% um, of funding is allocated, goes to um, women-led ventures, 6.7% to mixed teams, and the other 92% to male-led ventures. I was wondering, how is this with your funds, and are there any learnings you could share uh, regarding diversity and inclusion? Thank you. For us, it's actually not a target by itself, but um, yeah, we've been looking at our portfolio and also at the recent deals we've done, not everything's disclosed yet, but we definitely uh, have uh, a lot of companies with a mixed ma management team and even uh, also female CEOs. So uh, we, yeah, we're definitely there uh, from that perspective. I think this is a big problem. Uh, I think our portfolio is not exception. Uh, most of the founders are guys. Uh, I think it's not the pr only the problem with the startup world, but like with the business world in general, probably. My theory is it comes like, I don't know, it was 70, 80 years ago that women couldn't even vote. And when they were not able to do that, the men built the business world as we know it today. And where we are, it's a legacy maybe of that past. Uh, and I think it takes a deliberate action to like change it a little bit. So for example, for like our internal event that we're planning right now, like we work really hard to make like, you know, the participants, the speakers, that there is a good balance. Uh, and I think like most of the VCs are guys, their friends are guys, and they need to think more about females in the ecosystem, and they are there. There is awesome entrepreneurs and stuff. It's just there is more guys in the positions of power in this industry, and as a result, I think everything else follows. But I think the industry is aware of that since a couple of years, and I think things are changing for the better, but are nowhere good, I think. Uh, what, what, what do you think? <laughs> oh, um, actually, I think it's a, it's a great time to be a, a female founder right now because, um, as the guys mentioned, it is changing right now and it's, it's, it's a trend that everyone is riding and there are f several funds that only allocate money to female founders and you should find them out and uh, reach out to them. Goldman Sachs has, a, I think, 300 million for female founders, for example. And it's actually, you are, all of a sudden privileged if you think about it. So uh, I think very, very good news for all the female founders here. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's on the rise. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, give a warm applause to top tier VCs.